Hey guys, welcome to The Spin. My name is Caitlin Bowers. I'm Jonathan Malasson. I'm Shafali Kabatnagar. I'm Kevin Lors. And today in this episode, we'll be talking a little bit about COVID and where that stands right now. So let's go ahead and hop right into it. So Shivalika, the CDC director said that the vaccine would be ready next summer or early fall, but Trump said it would be available in weeks. Why do you think there's a discrepancy? Well, to be honest, I'm not sure if Trump fully understands the science behind creating a brand new vaccine for a brand new pandemic. Um, the CDC guidelines and timeline is actually very accurate and very helpful. I predict maybe next September in 2021, that's when we'll actually have a workable vaccine. Right now, we have 47 different vaccine trials across the world. 27 of them are in stage one, I believe. Uh, stage two, I think there's 14. And stage three, where they start actually testing on humans, I think there's only about seven. And there have been some discrepancies across the world. In Europe, there was a vaccine that caused a spinal, uh, spinal fluid inflammation. And so they shut that vaccine trial down to um, what they quoted as saying, they wanna make sure that their vaccine trials for stage three are humane because you're testing them on people, roughly 20 to 30,000 people. And these vaccines in themselves may only provide a certain first tier level of uh, immunity, like six months, you might have to end up taking boosters. So I'm not sure what Trump was talking about when he said that he wants to start turning out vaccines this year as, as early as before the election. But um, the way science works is that it does take time and it is critical that these vaccines actually are non-harmful to people who take them, that they don't cause other situations in the human body. So I think, um, I don't know why he said that. I'm not sure what type of information he's getting. Perhaps it's just a political minded motivation so that he looks good for the election. All right, well, I'm gonna be really skeptical right here and I'm gonna be very cynical and I'm gonna say that it's basically just an election year ploy because ironically, the first, the couple, um, the few weeks from now, uh, that's like when early voting starts, which is like 20th of October around that time. So the idea that we're gonna have a vaccine um, ready in a few weeks, it, is not is i think fanciful um i think even next year like quarter two or quarter three of next year i think even that's being very optimistic so the idea that this is going to be a few weeks from now right before the election um i don't see it um if you got it with these things you have to test and you have to make sure that you go through these trial signs as a process it's not just simply something you do you don't just throw a vaccine out there without going through the proper trials. So it some, sometimes it takes years to do a vaccine. So the idea that we're going to do it within, I don't know how many months since coronavirus popped up, but the idea that it's going to be right before the election is kind of, I'm just going to say convenient. Um, you know, Trump's always had a frayed um, relationship with the quote unquote experts. I, just, I say quote unquote, not to knock, um, their expertise, because I truly believe in the CDC. I believe in, you know, you know, public administrators and everything like that. But at the same time, I do understand, you know, that that's what he thinks, you know, so, but those experts, um, they're the ones who like, went, you know, eight, nine years through school just to practice one profession and then work their way up through merit. So the idea that they're just kind of lying about the timeline of the vaccine and masks is just, I just, yeah. I don't trust the president at all with that kind of thing, so. Clinical trials alone takes at least a year or two or each trial to even move on to the next phase. Phase four, of course, being that being FDA approval, that takes about a year or two as well in order to push through to make sure it's okay to distribute to the public. Politics is not gonna, you know, trump over, you know, no pun intended, lives. But um, essentially, okay, you can make a case for, you know, global warming, that being, you know, part of science. But as far as this, as far as this goes, as far as m distributing medicine on a global scale, it, it's, not, it's not quite that simple. So I do not believe that, I do believe that he's feeding people false hope in regards to having a vaccine in a time, uh, in a, 
immediate future. I do not believe that, um, as my co-hosts have stated, that it's possible that a vaccine would be in our immediate future. I don't believe that it would satisfy his political agenda. I just feel like basically this is just something that he just wants to say in order to give those hope to vote for him just in case he would like to, he feels like he can expedite the process. So Kevin, Trump recently said that he blames the blue states for all of the, well, for um, a big amount of the number of COVID deaths, saying that if you took out major cities such as New York, then the deaths would be a lot lower. But uh, research shows that um, it's about half and half in terms of like COVID in red and blue states. How harmful do you think this spread of information is? It's basically, it's politicizing deaths and, and COVID, which is what we've been doing since April, unfortunately, um, when Boxdown started. So the idea that, you know, um, first and foremost, if you look at the red states per capita, I'm pretty sure the red states have had more, and I'm not trying to be political, this is just what I have seen, is that per capita, um, you know, red states kind of have had it pretty bad too. So the idea that, you know, it's just the blue states and it's the blue states' faults. It's, it's ridiculous. First, and not only that, if you look at, for example, the response, um, in the initial stages of the, um, of the pandemic, when we were looking for, when the states were looking for PPE, um, instead of doing the Defense Production Act, instead of nationalizing or federalizing the response, he just left it up to the open market for the states to just get PPE. And that actually does not help places like Mississippi or Alabama or Nebraska or any states that are, you know, not as rich as say California or uh, Massachusetts or New York, which are blue states. So the 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 fact that Trump had all the red states competing against all the states competing against each other has actually hurt the red states because they're not because places like Mississippi and Alabama are not as rich as say New York. So New York basically won out on PPE. So the idea that you know that it's 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 it's, it's it's ridiculous. That's, that's, what, that's what I got to say. So granted, New York, as of, um, as of the 17th, had 32,000 cases. Granted, New York uh, still basically was, well, was considered the epicenter of the COVID-19, um, the COVID virus for quite a while. But Texas, being one of the states in the top five, currently has 14,800 uh, 14, 14, deaths. So I get what he's trying to say. I understand that. But even though California has more cases than Texas, Texas has a lot more deaths. Now, California, if I'm not mistaken, currently is leading the United States in cases. But states like Florida, who has 12,000 deaths right now, are right behind it. New York is actually slowing, slowing the curve. So I get that he... I get what he's saying, but at the same time, it's like Kevin stated, it's kind of putting politics on life. So it's not necessarily, I'm not sure if he's trying, what, where is he trying to appeal, what audience he's trying to appeal to when it comes down to this, but at the end of the day, it's going to hurt his political agenda if he's basically stating blue states are responsible for this, but in red states are not, because it, there's swing states. Swing states are definitely going to make sure, okay, if he's talking about us or is he not talking about us? You know, so in Florida is a very big swing state. So I would not cause any division. If I was him, I would not cause any division at this point when it comes down to using the coronavirus for a political agenda because it's, it's a double-edged sword. I agree. Um, I think he is the president of all 50 states and to start to draw the lines in the sand for a pandemic, a virus that spreads from person to person across state line, um, and to say the blue states did this, the blue states did that, I think that's um, reductive. A human life is human life. And it doesn't matter if more people died in Iowa or Hawaii, it matters that people are dying and they're still continuing to die. The infection is still spreading. and um, I don't understand, other than politics, how to 
how that idea or that concept even came about. He gave a press conference in the White House today where he had a graph and um, where he had this huge bell curve and it was all shaded in dark blue. And then there was a small little gray line that said, if the blue states, you don't count them, then this is where we would have been. We would have had the lowest numbers in the world, but we don't. And they count because they're all Americans together. I don't understand where this logic is coming from. And it can only be that it's an election year and he has got to rile up the red states and empower them to say it's red versus blue. It's more of this us versus them mentality and the coronavirus doesn't care who you vote for. If you get infected, you get infected. And it just speaks, it diminutizes the loss of life in any state. When you are infected with COVID and you are put on a ventilator, you're not allowed to have visitors. You are in quarantine. These people who have lost their lives died alone. Where is our humanity? Where is his? All right, guys, let's take it a little bit back home now. So the University of North Florida is now urging students to report COVID violations amid evidence of like several different parties involving university students. Do you think this will help at all? Or was it doomed from the start to even have in-person classes this semester? Shavalika, what do you think? I think having in-person class was actually necessary for many people in different degrees. You have people that need campus resources that pay tuition for those campus resources. And you have plenty of students from out of the city that have to live in the dorms. I think it is, um, there's this trend uh, right now on social media of like on TikTok, for example, um, students at their own university publicizing that, look, if you're having a party, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell somebody because I'm not paying all this money going to student loan debt, borrowing money from family and the government to just get put on online only education. What is the difference between a real in-campus experience and the University of Phoenix or DeVry University online? So I think that there are a lot of people who are students who are saying, look, if you're breaking the rules and having a bunch of people without masks hanging out, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to say something about it because I don't wanna lose the benefits that I pay for from my education. So I don't, I don't think it's doomed from, from the beginning. I think it's a very preca uh, precarious situation. And we knew coming into the semester, we'd have to play it by ear. So, so far, I think University of North Florida is at least doing a, a slightly good job of in-person classes. And a lot of the remote work does, does make up for that safety barrier. And I wouldn't say it was doomed from the start. Like if you compare how we've reopened to other universities, there, there, there are universities with entire housing blocks that are completely isolated. And we haven't reached that point yet, which is great. Um, you know, at the same time, I want to know, for example, I was looking on the Spinnaker article just now, 36% of classes are in person. I want to know like, where did that come from? Was that an empirical, yes, we can only have 36% of our classes done in person, or was it just, oh, we need 36 people, 36% 36 of our classes uh, in person because that's what we want. And that's the question that I want at answered. Um, but, you know, it, in my opinion, um, in my opinion, uh, it's, you know, I don't like the way that, I like the way that the university has handled the situation, but I don't like the way the university has handled concerns in the sense that I see first, I think, you know, for example, President Szymanski, I met with him over the summer with several other people. Um, I'm a 22 year old man, you know, I have a job, I pay bills. His, his wife is a wonderful person, but she read me a child's book. Um, so that kind of shows the, kind of how I think he holds the, the regard he holds for me. I asked him a question, for example, about, you know, we're in the midst of hurricane season and most of my classes are online. So if I lose power for three weeks, like I did with Irma, you know, what's going to happen? Never got a response. Um, so at the end of the day, while we have handled the, the, the reopening well, I think the communication needs to get better between the, between the student body and President Szymanski. But at the same time, I want to just you know, tip my hat to um, the Dean of Students. She's been great about this. She was great with the, with the Canvas course. She was great about making sure that people took that course um, and that they knew what they needed to do. 
Um, but at the end of the day, like I said, I don't think it was doomed, but I, you know, it's just, we, we, I've seen people walking around without masks, you know, at UNF. And even if you're not like, even if you're even, it, you know, sitting down is one thing when you're six feet away from other people. But when you're like walking around, you know, in enclosed places and you're talking with people face to face, like I've seen people who are tabling who did not have masks on. Guys, we got to we got to report that, you know, that's not that's not right. You know, that's not what we should be doing. So I would say it's a mixed bag with our response. Um, initially, yes, we have done well, but we need to the student body needs to do better at reporting violations. And we need better communication between the administration and the student body. So essentially, asking the students to be more responsible for themselves, I don't see a bad thing about that at all, the, to be responsible for each other. Because of course, this just present, prevents the spread. This just prevents mm -hmm. the campus from having to close indefinitely. Mm -hmm. You know, for so it's not even just the students that are actually being responsible for each other, but it's also the um, teachers as well. I met recently with Clarence Hines, who is uh, an assistant uh, associate professor for the music department, who basically told us, of course, with music being such a hands-on hands uh, subject, mm -hmm. that they actually went to hybrid. So they have 10 people in class, and they'll also have protective per, uh, personal protective equipment for each for each student, especially if they're using air-based instruments. So the majority of the classes are going to be remote. And the majority of the classes, I mean, and some of the classes are going to be in person only if necessary. Mm -hmm. So they have been able to handle a lot of things remotely by just sending recordings. So the teachers are being responsible as well by making sure that nothing happens on their watch. And of course, because they have families too that they don't want to drag this on through because for most teachers from what I've spoken to, and I've spoken to at least three, there's not many, there's not much communication between, you know, the, the faculty in regards to what to do. They're basically running off the CDC guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, from, from what Heinz has re referred to me uh, during his interview, they're basically just running off the CDC guidelines. Nothing is being reported directly from the school on how to do anything, but they are still implementing personal protective equipment for students if they do have to come in. I know for immediate students, it is especially difficult because, of course, we can't go through and use the studio this semester, which, of course, it's that's kind of a big chunk of our learning curriculum. So it's hard. It's I respect the school for saying that young adults need to be responsible for under other young adults. But at the same time, it's kind of we already have a lot going on, as Kevin said, like we have school, we have work. Why should we have to be responsible for the next person? And I get the, stu the school's perspective is kind of like, if we don't contain this, then we don't know what we can do as far as teaching and you know respecting the tuition that students is paid because we're gonna have to close if this thing cannot be contained. All right, guys. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our discussion about COVID related stuff. Um, my name is Caitlin. I'm Jonathan Malasa. I'm Shafali Kabatnagar. I'm Kevin Lors. And this has been The Spin.